studying Hegel's philosophy for life. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good, uh, good evening, uh, whatever the time is uh, when you're watching this. We're going to take a look at paragraph 503, uh, which is the opening of the section B, Morality, in Hegel's Encyclopedia. Um, with this video, I've also prepared a handout and the German text and the English translation of paragraph 503. When, if, if you're watching this on YouTube, you won't find those documents on YouTube. If you're listening to this on Anchor, uh, you won't find the documents, but you need to click on the link and go to the Hegel Courses website. There you will find uh, those documents. Okay, so we have now this general pattern of dealing with uh, with the text. I'm reading the German version first, and then we take a look at the translation, and then we try to um, uh, understand Hegel's text sentence by sentence, and word for word if necessary. Now we're reading the encyclopedia, let me just remind you of that, we're reading the encyclopedia because that is the quickest way to get a grip on Hegel's social philosophy. Um, of course we will all, you must also read the philosophy of right, the, the, the larger uh, volume, um, but that is for me at this moment just an extra source uh, that I can use in order to understand the text of the encyclopedia. Um, secondly, you need to, maybe you need to go back to the previous um, audio, that wasn't a video, it was an audio of paragraph 502, to take a look again, again at the distinction between right and subjective will, which is the uh, transition point between abstract right and morality. Just a quick reminder uh, of what you will find in paragraph 502. So we have there three uh, main theses that Hegel has developed. Number one, the personal will gives itself an immediate existence in the reality of right. It does so through the agreement and the contract. Um, secondly, Two, subjective will gives this right its existence, or denies it in injustice. It has two uh, relationships with uh, right, affirming it or denying it, which implies that this uh, personal will is still different from the right. It's different from the contract. It can withdraw itself from the contract, as, as we have seen. But thirdly, this subjective will, in as far as it is in contradiction with the right, is on account of the right, so on the basis of the universal, or through the force of the universal, that will exert itself, uh, non-existent. It, es ist ein nichtiges, Hegel says. It cannot maintain itself, it will go under. Now, in order to prevent itself from going under, simply disappearing, um, and then we would have a society in which there is just the um, uh, just the law. We only have the validity of the law. And we have persons that um, will deny the law or um, <clears throat> will affirm it, and, and that's everything. That's all we can say. And then there would be no rational society. It would not be a true social society. Um, Something has to be done. Now, and we have found that what has to be done um, is to take a next step to make it possible for the particular free will that feels that in the contract its own arbitrary volition, its own particular needs and desires are being ignored, that that particular free will rises to the level above this uh, non-existent opposition and contradiction to um, universal right, that this particular free will uh, becomes a unity with the universal, that it affirms the universal. Um, 
if you can call abstract right the sphere of uh, I want what I want and that is the case also for someone else so we need to have this agreement and this common will etc then now we enter into a sphere where you might say I want what I wanted I'm going to affirm the volition that was involved in the contract uh, even though at the present uh, I've changed my mind and I want something else arbitrary will can change its mind and then it has a new object but the social will the moral will uh, will not do that it has as its object not simply the thing the external thing that it desires it has as its object itself it affirms itself in its previous uh, stage in its previous moment where it desired to have this agreement and um, went uh, entered into a contract so that is what Hegel calls the reflexion in sich the reflection into itself uh, instead of uh, being completely up, uh, absorbed by its object by this external thing um, it focuses itself upon itself it affirms itself as uh, the will that was so therefore the um, phrase uh, that within morality I want what I wanted now of course Hegel has a lot to say about um, um, this transition also in paragraph 104 of the philosophy of right and there we have uh, over against each other the possibility of a crime of injustice das verbrechen a crime and uh, that's the third stage of um, injustice um, <clears throat> because it's absolutely uh, um, uh, it's um, intentional and over against that we have punishment rechende gerechtigkeit uh, uh, the revenge uh, in the form of justice or justice in the form of revenge now that is the stage in which we are and now we have to find out how we can um, uh, bring into unity the freedom of the will that is behind das verbrechen the crime this power to oppose the right um, which comes from my particular concrete individual will arbitrary of course but that's where it comes from from my individuality over against the response to that by society which is now portrayed as has to be portrayed portrayed as um, a, a revenge a, a, a retributive justice a retributive justice okay now that is the reminder for paragraph 502 and let's go to paragraph 503 so I invite you to um, go to the website if you're not already there and uh, take your uh, take the handout uh, together with the text and then uh, we will discuss um, this text so let's go to paragraph 503 which has five sentences five sentences in total and as you can see in the translation the same um, uh, five sentences appear there in English uh, the translator has done its best to make this completely in conformity with the German original. So let's go to the German text first. Das freie Individuum im unmittelbaren Rechte nur Person, so Person, that is the person uh, that we talk about in the sphere of uh, right, the sphere of law, is nun als Subjekt bestimmt. So we have to deal with this difference between Person and Subjekt. There is a difference here. Person belongs to the abstract right and subject, subject, belongs to the sphere of morality. Um, in sich reflektierter Wille. I already explained that. That is the will that is the, uh, focused upon itself as will. It affirms itself as will. Which is not the implicit recognition of itself as will that we have when um, we talk about the will uh, as directed toward an external object there is also an element of um, reflectedness in that 
um, in the sense that I need to be aware of my will in order to be able to will something. But the focus then is on the something that I will. In sich reflektierte Wille, uh, that means that the object of the will is not so much the thing, but in this case, the will uh, by which I want the thing is the object of the will. I want to affirm, not that I long for or desire this object, but I want to affirm that I will it or that I willed it. In sich reflektierte Wille, so dass die Willensbestimmtheit überhaupt als Dasein in ihm, als die Seinige, unterschieden von dem Dasein der Freiheit in einer äußerlichen Sache, sei. So the determination of the will has now uh, received an existence in itself. Uh, the, 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 this, uh, this inner awareness and consciousness of what I want and this consciousness of the fact that I want uh, at all, that I want something, um, that is an existence, that has an existence. Within me there exists, the, and the will exists. It doesn't exist in the outer world. In the outer world there are only objects that I may want or don't want, or, or want at first and then no longer want. But now <clears throat> freedom has a, a reality not just reflected through or by the external object, which is the focus of my desire, but it has a, an existence also within myself. Let's briefly go to the English translation. The free individual who in mere law, I remember that this translation that I use, uh, I forgot uh, by whom, um, he, he translates Recht, um, uh, so the just, the just, is maybe the best translation of this word, das Recht, he translated by law, so he says in mere law, where Hegel says, unmittelbares Recht. Well, immediate right is not the same as um, mere law. Uh, I hope you can understand that just by itself. The free individual who in mere law counts only as a person, well, it, it, it's correcting so far as taken on its own, and not as a translation. Um, we have this notion of rechtspersoonlijkheid, uh, that is within the sphere of the law, uh, people are persons and not things, and there is a specific legal definition of being a person, which is different from being a subject or being a citizen or being a human being, etc. So this word person is here used not in, in our sense of personality, but in the sense of a bearer of rights or someone who can act in conformity or in, in contradiction to the law. It's now characterized as a subject because it's a will reflected into itself, so that be its affection, and by affection he means determination, willensbestimmtheid, the affection of the will. My English is not good enough to make a determination uh, about the uh, correctness of that translation, um, but okay. As long as you understand that affection means the same as bestimmtheit in this translation. Be its affection what it may, so whatever external determinacy it has, it is distinguished as existing in it as its own from the existence of freedom in an external thing. So that's the new dichotomy, so to speak, or the new relationship that we have. Um, <coughs> we have the free will that is focused upon itself, affirms itself, and we have, we still have, it hasn't been obliterated, we still have the freedom of the will that is focused upon things. Um, also within morality, people are owners, uh, proprietors, they uh, sell and they exchange and they enter into contracts, etc. But now we must reconsider all of that from the viewpoint of morality. Okay, let's go to the second sentence of paragraph 503. Damit, dass die Willensbestimmtheit so im Innern gesetzt ist, ist der Wille zugleich als ein besonderer, unterstreiten die weitere Besonderungen desselben und deren Beziehungen auf ein ein. 
Let's go straight to the translation. Because the affection, the determination of the will is thus inwardized, interiorized, the will is at the same time made a particular. Of course it is. Um, because this happens within an individual. Uh, not uh, an individual taken in an abstract manner, but in my concrete uh, self-determined um, uh, life and, 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 and individuality, this is happening. There is no other way to inwardize or to interiorize um, the determinations of the will. That has to be something that an individual does. So the will is at the same time made a particular. I am a particular person, or rather, uh, I'm a particular subject. Um, I have all these characteristics. Um, uh, for one thing, I like coffee very much. So all my examples were made uh, 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 about coffee cups. Um, that is part of my particularity. That's something that uh, belongs to me as a physical being with desires and appetites, and etc. Now, when that uh, affection of the will is inwardized, all of these characteristics, this, these concrete characteristics of my individuality, come into play again. So what was excluded within abstract right is now included again. Because my will is now a particular will, and not a formally universal will, as it uh, arises within the contract. And there arise further particularizations of it. So it is an infinite number of characteristics that I have. And relations of these to one another. It becomes very concrete. Subjectivity is very concrete. In a way, uh, you, you, know, you might argue that what Hegel calls here subjectivity is what we use, uh, I used to call personality. As someone's personality with all its characteristics uh, of behavior and viewpoints and um, feelings, etc., etc. That is what Hegel means when he talks about subjectivity. Let's go to the third sentence. Die Willensbestimmtheit des Teils, als die an sich seiende, die der Vernunft des Willens, das an sich, recht, äh, an sich rechtliche und sittliche, Teils als das in der tätlichen Äußerung vorhandene, sie begebende und mit derselbe ins Verhältnis kommende Dasein. We go straight to the translation. This affection is partly the essential and implicit will, the reason of the will. Well, I think it might be better to translate the rationality of the will, the Vernünftigkeit, and the higher rationality of the will. And... Um, that is what this, this determination, this particularity of the will um, is about. It, it's a specific way in which the universal will, in which the concept of freedom as such, has become interior to me. But within me, universal freedom exists. It's, it's not simply that I have a concept of my individual freedom. Then we would go back to the Opening paragraph of the philosophy of right, we will be discussing again, <coughs> again, <coughs> the uh, preposition, the um, conditions, the conditions of abstract right and concrete freedom. We're not going to do that, of course. So we must admit that within our own consciousness, our particular way of understanding our freedom and affirming our freedom as something that. Uh, was expressed in what I wanted, the contract that I made or entered into, um, that that is part of my particular my particular will. This universality is part of my particular will. But also, partly, it is the existent volition which is before us and throws itself into actual deeds and thus comes into relationship with the former. I'm going to act either in conformity with the law and the right in conformity with the common will as expressed in the contract or not. I'm going to make a decision about that. And the concept of moral liberty <clears throat> implies that what I want to do is to affirm the volition that entered into the contract and that made the contract. That That is the whole idea. So 
the particular moral will is on the one hand a particular mode of this universal will, this universal and rational will, freedom that desires freedom, that affirms itself as freedom, and therefore also affirms the expressions of its freedom uh, and the concreteness of ordinary life. And on the other hand, it's the action, the action that I undertake, which is either in conformity or not in conformity with that. An action that comes from within. So we're not talking about things anymore. We're talking about actions. We're talking about the Dasein uh, des Willens, uh, the, the uh, existence of the free will within myself. Let's move on to paragraph 4, or sentence 4 rather. The subjective Wille is in so fern moralisch frei, als diese Bestimmungen innerlich als die seinigen Gesetz und von ihm gewollt werden. So that is the extent in which the subjective will is morally free, because all of these determinations, um, determinations from these two spheres, the rationality of the universal will and the particularity of my actions, um, are both then affirmed by myself. Uh, uh, it's my action and therefore my responsibility. And this is my take on universal rationality. Uh, for those of you who have knowledge of that, there is a hint here of um, a totally different uh, approach to humanity, and that is from Jean-Paul Sartre, a hint of his concept of freedom. Um, okay, let's leave it at that before I uh, overload this video again. Let's go to paragraph 5, sentence 5. Seine tätliche Äußerung mit dieser Freiheit ist Handlung in deren Äußerlichkeit er nur dasjenige als das Seinige anerkennt und sich zurechten lässt, was er davon in sich selbst gewusst und gewollt hat. So its effective expression in this freedom is action, handlung, something that I do. In deren Äußerlichkeit, so uh, in the externality thereof, an action is something that happens in the world. Um, the what happens in the world um, with reference to my action, I only can recognize if I have wanted that. that. That is mine. In every action, the only thing that is mine is what I want it to happen. So uh, if I take a cup of coffee um, and it um, uh, falls to the ground because someone hits me, etc., uh, there is an action, and the action is the breaking of the coffee cup and the falling out of my hand. Now, obviously, the action uh, for which I'm responsible is the action that I actually uh, intended to execute. So if my intention was to break the coffee cup, then all of it is my responsibility. But if my intention was just to take it and to drink from it, and someone else took it from my hands, it's obvious that my action is only that part uh, that I wanted uh, to do. I have to know about it and I have to be aware of the fact that I wanted to do it. And only then can I say that is my action and only then will I acknowledge towards others that yes, I did really do that. Uh, so if someone um, <clears throat> kicks the cup out of your hand and someone else says, look what you've done, then I have a complete right to say, no, that's not what I did. That's um, mainly something that this other person did. And that is important. Um, I can only take responsibility for that part of my actions that actually did something. Now, there is a wonderful example by, uh, by uh, Paul Ricoeur. Uh, Ricoeur says, take for a moment the situation of the Second World War. We have the resistance and we have a cloister, uh, a monastery. The monastery is on a hill and the resistance, the leader of the resistance made a decision. That's person A. The leader of the resistance uh, made a decision that he wanted to poison all the residents of that uh, monastery because th those residents were German soldiers. 
they took up residence in that monastery. So to um, the leader of the resistance, that's an act of resistance, part of uh, the war with the Germans. Now, he's not going to poison these Germans himself, he's going to poison the water well through an intermediary, someone who is cognizant of um, uh, poisons and uh, who knows how to spread that toxic toxic toxicity of the poison in the right manner and he knows um, how uh, water is provided to the monastery and he is going to do it so he goes to a well and he throws in um, a handful of poison enough to um, kill um, uh, several herds of cattle so he knows now that whenever the occupants of the monastery are going to drink they uh, drink water they will uh, become poisoned now there is a third party also because within the monastery there is someone um, who is appointed to look after the water pipes etc he is a frenchman who has been forced to do so he's not there voluntarily and he's also a part of the cooking staff and he is the one who places a carafe of water on the table etc pours that water into uh, glasses and gives that to the German soldiers. Um, and he has been told not to drink of the water. He doesn't know why, but it uh, has been said with, with great earnest, um, don't drink the water tonight. So he doesn't do that, but he does pour water into the glasses and gives it to the German soldiers. Now let's stop here. I think Ricoeur has two other subjects, two other agents involved in what now happens. Now, as you can imagine, the Germans drink of the water and um, most of them die within several hours and the others are crippled um, and have to go to hospital. So that monastery is, quote unquote, liberated. Now, who is responsible? The leader of the of of the resistance is not responsible. The only thing he, he did was say something. And by saying something, you can't kill people. The guy who put the poison in the well might have been responsible, but he didn't know that nobody told the Germans that the water would be poisoned and that nobody took care of the poison as soon as it was discovered and nobody took the... Um, initiative to find out whether the water was uh, poisoned. Uh, let's say that it had a yellowish color and, and there was ample reason to investigate, but they didn't. And there is the guy who was told not to drink of the water. And he might have imagined why, but he didn't. He didn't think about it. So he gave these Germans water and sort of fall down one by one. Now, who is responsible for the death of these Germans? Any one of these, uh, A, B, and C, can say, what I did was not the immediate cause of the um, death of the German soldiers because I didn't want it or didn't know beforehand. Now, the only one who did know beforehand who wanted it is the one who barely did anything and just told someone to do something. The guy who poisoned the well didn't know exactly what would happen with the water in, in the monastery. And the guy who poured the water had no idea it was poisoned. Although he might have guessed from the um, warning that he himself was, was given. So, when Hegel says here in the fifth sentence, this effective expression of this freedom is action. But in that action, the free will can only recognize as his and thereby recognize as his responsibility what he has known beforehand and wanted. And you might add that then only when this action is indeed effective, when it 
works. Let's say the, the, the poison doesn't rise up to the level of the monastery, or the guy doesn't use poison but herbs, or <clears throat> the guy in the monastery didn't pour out that water, but he took water from a bottle, etc. Um, if the action is effective, then only the fact that I knew about it beforehand and wanted it to happen in this fashion will make it my responsibility. And that is, in a way, um, a problem because in the example that I gave you from Recur, it's obvious that there are a lot of actions um, that are either non-effective, like that of the leader of the resistance, or they are effective without being wanted and uh, known beforehand, like that of the waiter in the monastery who poured the water. Does that mean that these three persons are above moral judgment? Of course not. It means that this ordinary concept of the moral free will is simply insufficient, as we will find out. Let's take a look um, at the English translation. I think I forgot about that. It's number five. Number five says, its utterance, Mwah. I don't like that. Its expression, indeed, with this freedom is an action in the externality of which it only admits as its own and allows to be imputed to it uh, somebody holds you responsible for what you're doing so much as it has consciously willed uh, as uh, Hegel says uh, in sich selbst gewusst und gewollt uh, you have to know about it you have to be aware of it and you have to want it now this Hegel says at the end, in the edition, it's Zusatz, that is what in Europe, in the European culture, is called freedom. This moral freedom. Um, the, with this distinction between external law and, and inner moral determinations. Um, so, what is morality, what is moral freedom in, in European sense? It's the, uh, the free will that desires to affirm itself as free will, with regard also to external objects, surely. <coughs> and <coughs> that is uh, not denying the validity of its previous volition, but affirming its previous volitions, all uh, uh, on the basis of its ability to choose. Let's not forget that the uh, arbitrary will isn't... Uh, obliterated, it's taken up, it's aufgehoben, uh, it's lifted up in a new synthesis. So, uh, all of these elements, the interiority of the will, and uh, that, that will needs to express itself in action, that I'm only responsible for what I knew and wanted before the action, all of that is part and parcel of our ordinary definition of morality. Now, take a look at the um, handout the handout turned out to be a little bit more than just a handout um, just read it for yourself you see um, there are questions at the end of each sentence I give an analysis of each of the five sentences and I'm trying to give something like the flow of the argument how is the argument going through the various sentences in this paragraph and so you'll find at the end, at the bottom of um, sentence number one, does this inner freedom truly reflect and express my individuality? And the answer is given as answer one um, after the summary of, uh, of paragraph two. I gave each uh, sentence a title. So the first sentence is called the nature of moral freedom and the second one, the particularity of the moral will, etc. So take a look at that, uh, just read it slowly, it um, um, enhances a little bit what I've been saying uh, in this video, um, but it's of no use to go through the handout itself. The handout is like a summary of what you have just been told by me. Okay, I hope you're doing well in your studies, I hope you like this new format, I'm going to make these videos together with the handout and with the relevant text. And again, you can find that on the uh, Hegel site uh, that you can find um, 
underneath this video. So you might hear this on Anchor and then it goes the same. Just take a look at the text um, underneath the, the Anchor uh, file and then you will find the website where you can obtain the two uh, documents that I've been talking about. Okay, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. See you next time.